Okay, uh, so introduction. Um, I'm Gary. Um, not related to Harry. Uh, <laughs> my background's criminology. Um, I've been teaching green criminology for 10 years now, which is kind of scary. Uh, my empirical research in this area has, has been a bit limited because for seven of those 10 years I was teaching at an institution that didn't give me much time for research. Um, so this is going to be a kind of conceptual presentation, if you like. It's going to be about the way I see criminology, or not just me, uh, the, way green, the way criminology can contribute to environmental issues in general, uh, and perhaps specifically uh, taking a legal uh, approach to regulating environmental issues. Um, I've got the Lancaster University Law School on the front slide, and it really upsets my, my preferred background, but you know they insist that we have it there somewhere. Um, but it's not going to be on any of the other slides. We can go with the, the background of the bleak mountains and the rising sea levels uh, that seems somehow appropriate. Uh, so, I should carry on. Uh, so there's the abstract, we won't worry about that, um, and there's a brief overview um, for those that are interested. I'll make the slides available at the end. Um, but as a starting point, I thought it was interesting to just situate green criminology, which is also sometimes known, or there are other terms, conservation criminology, eco-global criminology. In some ways these are interchangeable, in some ways the different terminologies maybe represent different subsets of what might broadly be seen as a, as a green criminology. Um, but I see the role of criminology, or green criminology, as, as bringing together the, the ecological and the legal and the social science perspectives uh, to combine them on this one problem, or group of problems, uh, of environmental issues. Um, and clearly there's intersections for any two of those things, as demonstrated on the slide. Um, I think it's, and I'm in this fondly, um, I think it's worth remembering that both lawyers and ecologists sometimes forget the, the people, sometimes don't understand people, shall I put it um, politely. Um, and that's where the social sciences can perhaps make an important contribution. You know, we can have these scientific frameworks that tell us what environmental problems are, and we can have these legal frameworks that seek to try and address these things. But if we forget about the human behaviour aspect, um, both the offenders uh, and the victims uh, in some cases, then, then that's where we get problems with, with translating environmental problems into effective uh, legal solutions. Uh, so that's where I see uh, criminology as being able to contribute. And criminology has certainly got very interested in environmental issues uh, in the last, I was going to say 20 years, but I've been saying that for 10 years. So in the last 30 years or so, uh, criminology has very much been contributing to uh, the debate about environmental issues and how best to respond to them. Um, even when I started in this area, yes, there was a 20-year history of, of, of green criminology, but talking to criminologists, whether students or whether colleagues, um, the general reaction was more often than not, okay, environmental issues are important, but what the hell has that got to do with criminology? Because, of course, for most people, the starting point of criminology is the more everyday crimes, street crime, violent crime, property crimes, etc. So I've spent a lot of time trying to convince people um, why criminology should be interested in environmental issues and what criminology can add to or contribute to the debate and attempts to prevent uh, environmental harms. Um, don't need to dwell on that too much. I mean, of course, the criminological interest in this reflects broader uh, awareness and concern about environmental harms, broader social movements, political movements, legal movements, um, also other areas of the social sciences getting more involved in in uh, environmental issues. Um, so there's a, you know, a common trend there, and green criminology is part of that broader trend. Um, some other terminology, but as I say, we'll, we'll stick with green criminology for now. Um, so yeah, so starting off, if you like, with a, a justification, or, or why should criminology care about nature? And of course, well, arguably there are two distinct answers to that question, although they increasingly come together. Um, firstly, we can recognise the administrative tradition of criminology, uh, which is a criminology that just takes what the government defines as crime and what the criminal justice system processes as crime as its starting point, without any critique as to how or why different behaviours come to be labelled as crime, uh, but just taking that as a starting point. And of course... Ooh, okay. I, I can speak more quietly if you prefer. No, it's, um, not, it's not about you. <laughs> um, okay, uh, having been muted slightly. Um, and of course, one of the, one of the, the, the 
the points of this whole session was that yes we do recognize that increasingly the criminal law is used as a response to environmental issues um, harking back for example to the <laughs> Let's see. Bear with me. It's not just going on. Right. Harking back to the Tony Blair government, and who would have thought that we would be missing the Tony yes. Blair government so much so quickly? Um, um, but um, this is good because it's just a useful self -enclo uh, enclosed uh, demonstration, if you like. Um, the new Labour government was famous for many things, but one thing it was known for was being a particularly criminalising government. It created more new criminal laws than. I'm not sure if I've got a direct comparison, but 3,605 new criminal offences created in a 10-year government, that's practically one a day, new offences. Um, and from a criminological perspective, what's fascinating there is that the two departments we think of as most likely to be involved in creating crime, um, the Home Office before it was split, so that was policing, that was what we would think of as everyday normal crimes, of course they're going to be a major uh, department in terms of creating crimes. Uh, when we remember white collar crime and corporate crime and financial crime, it shouldn't be a surprise that Department for Business, Enterprise and Regulatory Reform was also a huge creator of new crime. Uh, but it's quite illustrative to recognise that across that period, the department that created the most new crimes was DEFRA. Uh, so it was environmental issues um, broadly construed, and we can think of the food as part of the environment um, quite easily. But it's that area that has actually been the most uh, produce the most new crimes, or the most new criminal offences. Um, and of course that's not just a British trend, that's just an illustration, arguably we see this in other countries, and indeed at the level of international law, arguably environmental law is the fastest growing, or has been the fastest growing area of international law. So using the criminal law or other sort of similar frameworks, international law may be slightly different, um, that in itself is an explanation, if you like, or an argument as to why criminology uh, should get involved. Uh, and particularly even more so when we increasingly are, are told that there are overlaps between environmental crime and corporate crime, and incidentally going back to the last part of the last presentation, of course brown crimes are corporate crimes, whereas green crimes are more often individual crimes. We've got a longer history of recognising corporate crime, so that's a bit better. And to say the fines are higher maybe glosses over the fact that corporate corporations are paying those fines and individuals are paying green uh, fines, so maybe the but anyway, that's an aside. Um, we're told there's overlap between organised crime, drug trafficking, terrorism, etc. So that's a, another reason why green criminology should be interested. So even the most narrowly focused administrative criminologists um, should take note. Uh, but arguably the green criminology tradition has actually come more out of the critical and radical sides of criminology, um, which seek to critique the government led definitions or the criminal justice led definitions of what is and isn't crime and what should and shouldn't be the focus of criminal justice, of um, criminology, of, of applying the label crime. Um, and of course the critical tradition within criminology has been concerned not, it doesn't care necessarily what is or isn't defined as crime or it questions why some things are defined as crime when other more harmful behaviours are not defined as crime necessarily. And it certainly looks more at the background um, structural issues, power, class, inequality, um, and all of those issues, and um, how they relate to uh, victimology or victimization. So, you know, maybe less clear in wildlife crime, but certainly in, in brown crimes, human victims. Um, Critical criminology has a, a long tradition of, of looking at the victim, taking sympathy, um, understanding, looking at the interplay between the victim experience and these, these structures, the, these uh, power and, and economic structures uh, that lead to these issues. Um, we might also recognise that sometimes we look at offenders as victims, and for example, looking at poaching or other wildlife crimes, we may also have a sympathy with the offender, the immediate offender, who is, is uh, I don't know, killing the animals. Um, so there are traditions that I think feed very nicely into green criminology. I'm not going to dwell on this because it will be meaningless to non-criminologists, I'm not meaningless, but the point is there's a long history of criminology engaging critically with what comes to be defined as crime and how we recognise the label crime comes to be applied in the first place. Um, there's also within criminology you know, when Sutherland first started talking about white-collar crime, the establishment, established criminology, established criminal justice, established uh, politics, 
they were saying, well, this isn't criminology, these guys don't end up in prison, these are not the guys that go to court, we shouldn't be focusing on them. Of course now, any criminology course that ignored white-collar crime would be, would be laughed at. I see green criminology is in a position that white-collar criminology was um, 50, 60 years ago. Um, there's been a long focus within critical criminology of looking at crimes of the powerful, bringing that uh, into the overall debate. Um, and one way to look at this, or another way to look at this, is, is criminology's tradition of changing the unit of analysis, not necessarily looking at crime as the starting point, the definition, because that tells you know that reflects powerful interests, political process, the workings of the criminal justice system, etc. Um, so we've had a long tradition of, of, of starting with a human rights perspective, or indeed starting with a social harm perspective. Stuff that is harmful should be the rightful. Um, area of, of criminology, the right subject matter of criminology. So green criminology very much follows these traditions and certainly we can park a lot of environmental harm clearly within structural understandings of the world, simplifying we can point to global capitalism as one of the main drivers of most of our environmental harms. Um, a lot of that doesn't successfully get translated and become to be criminalised. Even when we introduce laws, we don't necessarily effectively apply the laws or effectively uh, label, um, apply the label of, of criminal. Um, but essentially, green criminology can be an extension of a, a rights perspective or an extension of a harms perspective that's well established within criminology. Um, there's another aspect that criminologists should be interested in, and that's recognising that increasingly environmental harm is not just something we should see as crime itself, it's also something that is often a factor in causing the types of crime that we might more traditionally think of as crime. Uh, so whether that's uh, the relationship, I'll come back to secondary green crimes in a moment, but whether that's an exposure to pollutants as a possible factor in causation of violent crime, which for the, within criminology leads to a massive debate, but there's clear evidence of a link there. Um, whether it's environmental victims um, seeking to protest and then as protesters being labelled as criminals to try and draw attention to their plight. Um, whether it's people being forced to migrate because of environmental issues, degradation of their rural homelands, so having to move to the city, and the relationship between migration and both committing crimes and being victims of crime. There are many ways that environmental issues are relevant to the cause of crime as well as being seen as crime themselves. Uh, so from this, I would argue that the remit of green criminology um, is quite broad, um, but we particularly focus on primary and secondary green crimes, and I've just done the tertiary green crimes, and not in a logical order necessarily. Um, primary green crimes, crimes that result directly from the destruction and degradation of the Earth's resources. This is air pollution, water pollution, deforestation, uh, abuse of animals, species decline, um, etc., etc. Um, that's, you know, that's a clear starting point for criminology. Not all of these things are labelled as crimes by the, the legal system, but that doesn't necessarily matter from a criminological perspective. We also recognise secondary green crimes, the, the way that actually when we do seek to use the criminal law to outlaw primary harms, that often generates a new range of crimes in its own right. So whether that's uh, corporations uh, seeking to avoid regulation and that leads into fraud or corruption or whatever, whether it's the role of organised crime in the illegal wildlife trade or indeed in the illegal trade in, in hazardous materials um, or what have you, um, that all goes in there. I'm going to skip those last few bits and move on to basically the sort of main point, if you like, of my talk. Criminology's got a lot of experience in a lot of things that are relevant to environmental issues, whether or not they're labelled as crime. Um, and it, you know, it's unnecessary, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, we should be drawing on the, the established track record of criminology in, in research and discussions uh, within these areas. Uh, so this is not an exhaustive list, but it's, it's quite a thorough list of the existing expertise of criminology as relevant to environmental issues. Um, so victimisation, the understanding that actually the experience of victimisation can be varied, can be complicated, um, just providing a legal system for redress does not necessarily mean that victims are going to engage with a legal system for redress because part of the nature of victimisation may be that you're 
unable or, or don't have the cultural capital to engage with systems, um, with, with legal systems or legal redress that does exist, um, we can gloss over that. When we just have a legal response to an environmental problem, we don't necessarily consider whether or not it's appropriate to the victims and whether the victims are in a position to engage with that, uh, for example. Uh, criminologists know a bit about the problems with creating mean of, meaningful laws and successfully applying the label of crime uh, of criminal in the first place. Just making something illegal doesn't necessarily stop it from happening. We know that. If that wasn't the case, then we wouldn't need criminologists or indeed the police. Um, in terms of improving the response to, to green as opposed to brown crimes, partly that's about getting the public and indeed the courts and the police to take those types of crime as seriously as other types of crime. So that, that means you know, engaging with education for the general public, it means training the police and the courts, etc., and, and recognising conflict between you know, police culture, where most police officers say in the UK would look at environmental crime as something that's not really what they signed up for. Whereas in the Dutch system, where the police are trained in environmental crime from the word go, alongside traditional crimes, they, they don't have any problem with seeing environmental issues as part of their remit. So, so there's stuff there about uh, about police culture, about a broader culture of successfully and meaningfully applying the label of crime and therefore hopefully changing behaviour. Um, obviously we know a bit in criminology about motivation, both individual motivation but also structural causes, looking at the role of inequalities, the role of, of business and the, the, the global uh, neo-capital hegemon that word, um, structure, <laughs> and, um, and the, you know, how that leads into causes of crime. Uh, we know about policing, not just the policing culture, but the idea of actually being able to respond to crime, um, being able to enforce crime. Um, sorry, half an hour at the time. Um, so there's a few things in there. Um, looking at effective deterrence, looking at the balance between um, not just how high your, your potential fine or prison sentence is, but of course it's whether or not that it's the celerity, it's the certainty of the punishment, as much as the severity of the punishment that is important in changing behaviour, is important in being an effective deterrence. Um, or there are issues around punishment, let's take the example of poaching again, is it meaningful or is it helpful to lock up local um, tribes, people for example, who might be doing the hunting, when really the main offenders are the organised crime groups behind that, or indeed the, um, the, the, the market demand in the first place. Um, so looking at the, the, the negative effects of misapplying punishment, of targeting the wrong people, these are all things that, again, criminology has long experience in, so we should be able to bring that to this. Um, looking at crime prevention theory, looking at routine activity theory, situational crime prevention theory that have been developed in the context of urban crimes in the Western world, but then teasing out the core principles there and realising we can apply them to wildlife crime in rural or wilderness areas uh, in the developing world, as to drawing parallels, learning lessons rather than starting from scratch uh, and having to go through all that again. Um, Recognising that there are broad similarities between the international Wild, the illegal wildlife trade and, and the drug trade and learning from our mistakes of trying to regulate and control drugs uh, and applying those lessons to, to the problem uh, of, the, of the illegal wildlife trade. And so my point really is that criminology is about changing human behaviour, it's about preventing transgressive activities and it, it speaks a lot to deciding what should be called crime in the first place, to effectively applying the label crime, to being able to police, to being able to effectively punish in a way that does lead to deterrence and doesn't lead to alienation and perhaps a worsening of the problem. Um, and yeah, my point is that we can draw on all of this experience and apply it to the problem at hand. And just as a final point, I want to say that it's a two-way process um, and that actually there's a lot that ecological science can contribute to criminology as well within the context of green issues, it's the ecology, the ecological sciences that lead us to understand what should and shouldn't be considered harmful and, and, and therefore possibly defined as crime in the first place. Uh, in perhaps a broader sense, it's ecolo ecological methods and, and a sort of systems thinking approach uh, that actually maybe helps criminology more generally to actually better respond to crime, not just environmental crime. Um, but yeah, a two-way or even a three-way, because the lawyers are in there as well, uh, but going back to the, the diagram at the beginning, that's, that's my point. That's where criminology can come in and save the day, uh, or at least save some 
rehashing old ideas and revisiting old mistakes. Uh, so I'll leave it there and uh, take questions if there are any.